So good afternoon, everyone. Um, our next speaker for this afternoon is Florian Forster, who will be presenting Collect D in Dynamic Environments. All right. Hi, everybody. Uh, I've been introduced. That is a first, to be honest. Uh, this should eventually, hopefully, go to the next slide. Oh, boy. Sorry about that. All right, so my name is Florian Foster. People tend to call me Octo because Florian is a, a common name in my age group in Germany. I've been doing open source work uh, for a while. Uh, I started uh, some Perl hacking, I guess, in uh, 2001. In uh, 2005, I started the Colleague D project, and uh, I've been hacking on stuff ever since, mostly infrastructure and backend stuff, so I'm not a GUI person. Um, I have a Google Plus profile uh, for you, if, if that's interesting for you, and uh, I'm on Twitter as well. Here we go. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, dynamic environments. Uh, I phrased it dynamic environments because I didn't want to abuse uh, uh, pass password bingo uh, terms, uh, but it's the cloud, whatever that means to you. Uh, for me, it's, it means that we have virtual machines, be it uh, virtual Linux machines that are scheduled somewhere or uh, Java in, in this particular case, and some form of, of job management system that will start a new machine here or tear that one down or start a new job over there. And you have this uh, dynamic, ever-changing uh, environment of, of jobs and of, of machines, and you kind of have to handle this. So that's what I meant by this. Uh, the agenda for today, for my talk. First, I'm going to talk about Colleague D and why Colleague D is a good choice for this environment. Uh, I'm going to cover what Colleague D can offer to people running the cloud itself instead, rather than e service inside the cloud. Um, and how, how, how different ways in which you can use Colleague D's network plugin to, to do communication between instances. The second third will be about aggregation, which is uh, an interesting factor and necessity in, in these kind of environments. Uh, the one part is uh, the aggregation plugin that is uh, included with Codec D, and then I'm going to uh, say a few words about Reman and Boson. Uh, and I'll end with storage solutions uh, from the S yes, the. Uh, the abstract says, old but proven RD tool to more modern approaches. And that'll be all right for today. Uh, I apologize in advance. It's, I don't do talks twice, so I hope I get the timing right, but I hope I don't run out of slides nor time. So why Colleague D? Um, Colleague D gathers metrics, and then eventually you can do stuff like this. Um, so the graphing part is not actually something that Colleague D does. Colleague D collects the metrics, it can send the metrics around, and eventually hands off the metrics to a storage system. It doesn't really do storage itself. It can write CSV files, but I don't really know any, anybody who's doing this in a, in a bigger scale. Uh, and that's it. So in, in th these words, it's doing one thing, and it tries to do this well. And since we get a lot of users and a lot of pull requests and a lot of people seem to know about it, I kind of have the impression that we're on a good, good track here. Uh, there's a link to Colleague D's homepage in case you don't use Google. Uh, and there's a Google Plus community that is uh, linked there. And there's also a Twitter account that every once in a while I know, announces new versions and so on and so forth. You might want to use Colleague D because, well, for one, it's a free and open source uh, project. There are hundreds of people contributing to it, literally. Uh, we started out using the GPL and eventually found that too cumbersome to integrate with some other parts of open source software. So we are slowly but steadily moving to the MIT. It's just very tedious work contacting all the contributors. Uh, Codec D is platform independent. 
Uh, it runs on FreeBSD, Solaris, and every operating system with an X in the name. Uh, it does not run on Windows. There's a commercial software that you can use uh, that integrates well with Colic D, but Colic D itself does only run on, on Unix. But on all Unixes that you can come up with, I guess. Uh, Colic D uses a very modular design that. Uh, that, that pulls in many plugins. Uh, a bit about that in a, in a, in a minute. Um, I, I write here that it's an agent-based design that's only half the truth. Uh, the same core daemon is running on all instances and depending on the plugins you load, depending on your configuration, uh, it will perform the one role or the other. So it's not inherently an agent-based design. If you only have one server, there's absolutely no need to, or one machine, there's absolutely no need to run a colleague D server, uh, which we'll see in a bit. Uh, so you can just store data locally. Or if you don't like sending metrics around, you could, in theory, store the metrics on every single machine itself. Again, it's a possibility, but nobody is seriously doing this. Um, it is extensible with plugins, and I'm going to uh, say some a few words about plugins on the next slide. Uh, if you want to uh, extend Colic D yourself to, to collect your own metrics, you have a wide variety of options. The plugins that ship with uh, Colic D are written in C for the most part. There are language bindings for Perl, Python, and Java. So if you like these languages better, you can use one of these languages. Uh, the plugins that implement the support actually pull in the Perl, Python interpreter or the Java JVM. So it's, it gets executed more or less natively and should be decently fast. If that's too much investment or too brittle or whatever for you, you can also use the exec plugin, which executes arbitrary scripts, bytes, what have you. And these scripts or binaries need to implement a very, very simple ASCII line-based protocol. Write this to standard out, and Colic D picks it up and, and does stuff with it. Um, it will take you literally a minute or so to get, get started and set up, so it's, it's really simple to get to get to results fast. Um, it also scales fairly okay, but many people kind of cringe at the idea. So plugins come in, in sort of different plugins perform different uh, things, uh, which if most plugins you can put into one category quite easily, but then there's a, a long tail of plugins that does something interesting and weird and doesn't fit any build really. Um, one, the biggest category is uh, read plugins. So read plugins get metrics from somewhere. The somewhere is often an operating system and the metrics will be something like a queue length or the number of packets sent or the amount of memory used by this application, that sort of stuff that operating system know about. Another set of, of metrics comes from applications, like the varnish cache can tell you how many hits it had and how many misses, and you can calculate a hit to miss ratio and so on and so forth. Uh, the Apache web server will tell you about the workers it has forked but not used yet or are currently handling a request. Uh, MySQL can tell you something about caches and uh, number of transactions and so on and so forth. So a lot of uh, infrastructure software will tell you some metric or other and it might be interesting for you or not. It, the nice thing about the approach of having plugins is that you load what you need and if you're not running MySQL, you're not loading the MySQL plugin and ColecD will have absolutely nothing to do with, Colic, uh, with MySQL. And the same goes for all the other uh, uh, services out there. And then there's, again, other metrics that you can read. Uh, it ranges from Xeon Phi, which is a hardware infrastructure by Intel for high performance computing. So essentially you have a, I think it's like a cell CPU or something on a PCI Express card and it can do teraflops of commutations or something. Um, and interestingly, on, on this PCI Express card, they run, I, I believe, uh, their own Linux and then communicate with the outside world, so you can 
query information from this embedded Linux on the PCI Express card. Uh, I didn't know this existed until somebody sent, sent in a patch. Uh, you can query SNMP for, from your network equipment. Uh, unfortunately, that's still a thing and not dead yet. One wire is a protocol to read uh, hardware sensors in a very easy and lightweight way. Uh, the company I worked with uh, a couple years back uh, aimed at reading the temperatures of their racks in the data center via one wire, but eventually gave up because one wire didn't scale to the, the size they wanted. And they went to Modbus. So I got paid for implementing Modbus support for quality D, and you can create Modbus. Uh, with us, and the list goes on and on and on. So there's a lot of stuff in there and a lot of interesting things, so chances are really good that the metrics you're interested in are already supported. On the other end, so that was getting the metrics. On the other hand, you want to do something with the metrics and writing them to somewhere. There's 15 something plugins that can do something like this. Uh, the most commonly looked up ones I've, I've put on this slide. So there's a Graphite plugin that can send data to Graphite. Uh, RD2 I already mentioned. Our tool itself doesn't do any networking. It's it's a library and command line tool, but there's a, an RD caching daemon that can add some networking infrastructure around our tool. And Colic D, the RD tool plugin of Colic D does essentially the same caching that the RD cache D is doing, uh, but it can also directly talk to the RD cache D and just send the values over there, and you go, you do your thing. Uh, it can talk to Riemann, which I'm going to talk about in the third half. Uh, MongoDB was like the new kid on the block for, for a couple of years, and nobody talks about it today, so I don't know where that is currently. Um, and one of the most generic uh, plugins is uh, a plugin that just encodes your metrics in JSON or another format and just sends it by a post request to somewhere. This is used by several startups that provide essentially metric storage and visualization on demand as a service. So with this, uh, what can Colleague D do for people running a cloud, like the cloud as an infrastructure? Um, there's a plugin that is currently called Libvirt. I'm going to rename this eventually, but no matter. Uh, which was contributed by Red Hat. So uh, I've seen a Red Hat earlier. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the Emergent Technologies team did this. So just. Oh, Colonel Kim. I, tell them I said hi if you run to them. <laughs> um, so, what libvirt, it, it's a library that, that Red Hat wrote and, and open sourced, uh, can do is it, it provides a unified interface to talk to hypervisors. And you can query uh, metrics from the hypervisor, which metrics exactly depend on the hypervisor, unfortunately, but on Xen, you get what is listed here. Uh, the CPU usage, unfortunately, it's only used or unused and no uh, more detailed CPU states. Uh, but that is unfortunately due to the way that hypervisors work. Uh, memory, again, basically the, the balloon memory size or how, many, how much physical memory is assigned to a guest and not necessarily how much memory the guest is using. Um, swap, disk, IOPS, and, and, and bytes, and last but not least, the network throughput. That sort of stuff. So very basic uh, metrics for, for a virtual machine. But the, the good thing here is you get all of these metrics more or less for free, as in you don't have to instrument the guest at all. This could be anything running in that guest, and you'd still get these kind of, of metrics out of this. Uh, you don't have to make your customers uh, load some library or run some daemon or anything. Your customers run some job on your cloud, and, and you get very basic uh, information that you can then provide to your customers on a website or look at yourself or whatever. Um, the configuration is simple. Uh, there are a couple more options that you can use if you're interested in, but this is like the, the smallest possible config almost. So you tell it how, which hypervisor to connect to. Uh, Xen, uh, Colin slash slash is apparently the default for connecting to your local Xen D. 
And in this case, it's actually limited to one guest. I'm only interested in this one guest. If you leave out that line, it will uh, get the information for all guests currently running. And then you get something along the lines of this. Again, Kogi doesn't do their graphs. Uh, it, it just provides the data. But that's something that you might end up having eventually. So it's uh, uh, the, the virtual interface, too, tells you kind of that this is Xen again. And, without instrumenting the, the guest here. So this is virtual machines as in virtual Linux servers running on some hypervisor. On the other end of the cloud spectrum, you might have uh, virtual Java machines that are scheduled to run somewhere. And, and you want to uh, get metrics from the JVM. And there's, there's a, a plugin that can help you out with this. The uh, generic JMX plugin, it's called, connects to a running JVM via the Java management extensions, JMX. And it can query all the mBeans that the J JVM is providing via JMX. Uh, mBeans are essentially Java's word for metric. Uh, you, the, the configuration is a, a bit more verbose. Um, but in the end of the day, you will get, again, essentially for free without instrumenting the code at all, um, memory information, garbage collection information, and some thread numbers, at least rough thread numbers, uh, from the JVM without having to instrument the code at all. So if, if you have like a third party binary that you want to run, that might also be an interesting option. This configuration is severely stripped down. It won't work exactly the way uh, it is pr uh, printed here. Uh, there are a couple of lines missing, but I wanted to demonstrate that you have to load the plugin and then you, you define these M beans over here. Can you see this? So, it's, so this is a definition, a mapping from the, the M beans of, that the JVM provides uh, to the, the data format that ColleagueD expects. And then you have, have a connection block down here that essentially tells you which JVM to connect to. And uh, what's missing here is information which uh, metrics you're interested in. So you can define or actually look, look at the ColleagueD wiki and find a, a longer list of predefined MBNs that people have already collected for Tomcats, Catalina, and some other service and so on and so forth. And you can just copy and paste this into your uh, configuration. And then you get something like this. So this is a Java memory. So you see that the, the use and the committed memory is slowly building up and eventually the garbage collection is run. And all of the objects in, in this memory segment are either deleted because they're not used anymore, garbage collected, sorry, uh, or move to a different memory segment called the, the young generation, I think. So. That's something you can get out of a, a, a JVM fairly easily. So this is what Kongi can do for people running other people's v VMs in, in code. <coughs> Next, um, I, I want to talk about how, how bigger ColleagueD setups can be uh, hooked up in, in various ways to, to, to make uh, to build a bigger metric collection network, so to speak. Uh, how, how to do metric collection in a bigger environment and one that might be, be changing. Uh, okay, uh, sorry. Um, the network plugin is a plugin that provides uh, ways to send metrics to somewhere else and also to receive metrics from the network. And which of the two it, it does depends again on the configuration. Uh, it's using a very efficient uh, binary protocol that needs, it kind of depends on the names of the metrics, but something between 50 and 100 bytes uh, per metric. So 100,000 metrics would amount to, let's say, roughly 10 megabytes per second coming in. So it's, it's essentially hard or impossible to saturate your network link just with metrics. You're going to run into IO uh, problems much more sooner when you're trying to, to store uh, these metrics to disk some, sometime. The, the protocol is, is using uh, UDP. Uh, it's strictly unidirectional, so the clients will send a UDP packet to the server and the server will never reply back. 
the idea behind this was that we really wanted to use uh, multicast at first and the uh, unicast implementation was added as an afterthought. So it, that means you can use multicast if, if you want to. Uh, most people don't tend to, use, to want to, but if you're playing with the cool kids, then multicast. Uh, and there's uh, there's a bit of crypto available, so you can sign uh, metrics before they go over an untrusted network, so people don't inject the garbage into your your metric system, uh, or you can encrypt the metrics if you want to hide whatever uh, metrics you're gathering. Uh, so especially if if data centers are linked with untrusted networks, so that tends to be an interesting option. So I said that the configuration defines the role because the configuration defines the behavior of, of the plugin. So if the plugin is configured to send metrics, then you would probably call this instance a client. And if you configure the plugin to receive metrics, you would probably call this uh, particular instance a server, even though the same binary is running on both of them. Uh, you can also send and receive at the same time building proxies, which makes it possible to forward uh, metrics to somewhere else. So. Again, on the right, you have a very, very simple or the simplest possible uh, configuration for the plugin. Uh, you tell the network plugin, in this case, that the server that it should send data to is example.com, and that's it. And the network plugin will take everything that it gets and just sends it to this server or whatever it resolves to. And contrary, uh, on the receiving side, you configure it with uh, listen, and the Cullen Cullen is uh, the uh, IPv6 any address. So it will listen on any interface. It will accept all the uh, packets on the colleague D port and will submit these metrics to, to colleague D. And uh, if colleague D is set up to, to write metrics to somewhere, all the metrics that it receives will eventually end up in the storage system. And last but not least, uh, one extra line is necessary for the forwarding uh, option. You listen on one end, you send to an, on the other side, and then you have to specifically specifically say, colleague D, that yes, I would actually like to forward the packets I, I received off of the network. If forward is false, so the inverse of this, colleague D will only send out metrics that it gathered itself and not the metrics it received from the network, making it possible for two server endpoints to send their own metrics, their own local information to each other. So with these uh, different ways of, of configuring the network plugin, you can build several types of networks, so to speak. Uh, the simplest is just send, have all your machines send the uh, metrics to one server. Just you and you and you all go to example.com, Every, everything's done. So the, the one config up here is uh, listen on the any address, that would be the config for the server, and the, the line below the server is a.example.com, would be the configuration for the three clients, and you would get roughly this setup. If you have two servers for fault tolerance reasons, uh, you simply add a second server line and you get something that looks a bit like this. So every client is sending out the metrics twice, once to the A server, once to the B server, and the servers again share the, the configuration and listen on, on any interface there is. Uh, if you want to set up multicast, uh, all you have to do is drop in a, a multicast address and the server will automatically detect that this is a multicast address now and uh, send the correct join uh, IGMP packets and if your network does the right thing, you're good to go. And you can do something that, let's call it multi-tier for now. So you have your data center here all set up with a single server uh, instance and you have two more data centers over there and you wanna get a, a global view of all the data centers uh, that run something and you wanna have all the metrics corrected in one uh, place. So you can, in this case, uh, two, two, but you can have a, a global 
collect the that that aggregates all the metrics in in one place, and you you can store it there or look at it there or whatever it is you you need to be doing. Or in in the forwarding case, uh, you can bridge. Like in the proxy case, you can bridge between technologies. So you can have a data center that uses multicast to get the, the metrics to the local servers, and then the local servers can use unicast to send the metrics upstream. Or you can have IPv6 within the data centers, but not over the external link. And then the proxy, again, allows you to, to bridge this uh, easily. With this, I'm coming to aggregation. Um, aggregation is uh, important in, in dynamic environments because you're usually not caring about a single instance or a single server. You, you tend to use uh, the cloud in a way that if, if one job fails, if one server fails, uh, you have enough running somewhere else to, to take the load. And eventually that server will come back or will get rescheduled somewhere else and you tend not to care about a single server. So setting up checks the way that not just, uh, for example, does it that you have a config file and these are all the checks that need to run on this server and if they fail then boom, uh, tends to be tricky. So aggregation, aggregates are often more useful for alerting. Let's say you don't really care if uh, one or two or three servers send out a HTTP 500 error once. But if your entire fleet sends out, I don't know, 2% 500 errors in, in all the requests they handle, that might indicate a serious problem in your code and you might want to, I don't know, beat your developers into fixing it. So the, the global view, the aggregated view of your system is, is more interesting than focusing on, on a single machine or a single job. The other two are kind of made up, I, I guess. Uh, metric storage is often I.O. bound or you might not have the capacity to, to store all the metrics in some other respect, uh, in which case it might be useful to just store a global aggregate of, of information for historic reference, and not so much to, to store all the uh, unaggregated data. Last but not least, dashboards should not overload the user or the, the sysadmin uh, with information. So you, you need to kind of uh, aggregate this to, to show it nicely in, in a nice dashboard. And uh, if you can do this or parts of this um, uh, beforehand, then you're better off for this. So the way the aggregation plugin in ColleagueD works is that on one side it subscribes to metrics, on the other side uh, it spits out uh, the, the aggregates in, in regular intervals. Um, it was added uh, two years ago roughly, so it's, it's in version 5.2. Unfortunately Debian Weezy still ships uh, an older version. So this would be like a, a schematic version of ColleagueD. On the left-hand side, you have the input plugins that read several metrics. On the right-hand side, you have your storage, whatever that might be. And the aggregation plugin kind of closes a loop here. So it, it gets metrics from the right, uh, aggregates them, and then acts as an input plugin again. Uh, there's uh, a prevention here that it does not allow aggregates of aggregates within the same ColleagueD instance in order not to, to have ever-increasing things in here that essentially only measure the running speed. Uh, since we're running short on time, let's skip this. Uh, the limitations of the aggregation plugin uh, is that it has only online algorithms, so it doesn't have a variable amount of state per aggregate. It only has quite simple things, such as minimum, maximum, average, uh, sum of, of numbers. Uh, that also means that there's no median and there's no percentile and there's a couple other stuff missing. Uh, if you want or need to have something like this, I recommend... Okay, I thought another slide was coming up. Um, this slide is supposed to show you that aggregation can happen at the, at the client. On here it can happen 
at the local level and it can also happen at the global level. So you can pre-aggregate stuff at, at the client if you don't want to expose detailed information about every single CPU, but only, I don't know, the, the global, I am using 90% of all the CPUs I'm having uh, information. So if the limitations of the aggregation plugin are make the aggregation plugin not suitable for your use case. You can use Riemann. Riemann is an event stream processor um, that can do uh, a crazy amount of of aggregation stuff and also emit additional events. And then you can use these created events to base your alerting off of, for example. So, for instance, you can have an exponentially weight moving average. Uh, over a given fixed time window uh, that is something very similar to what the load command on, on uh, Unix is doing, I think. And it, it also integrates with many storage options, so uh, colleague D, Riemann, and then some storage in the back makes a pretty good team. And very new and just recently released by uh, Stack Exchange's Boson. Uh, Boson also has uh, an expression language that can do all sorts of aggregations, and I believe they essentially hand this on to OpenTSDB. Um, so whatever OpenTSDB can do, I guess Boson can do. Uh, and they also have a website here. So with this, really quickly now, <laughs> the last part, storage. Um, the storage, again, can happen in, at all levels. So you can have the global colleague D storage its metrics uh, and have all the storage in, in one place. Or you can go the entire different way and have all the clients store the data individually, as I initially mentioned. Uh, not that that's super useful. Or you can do something in between uh, stored data on the local level, like on, on this intermediate level here. And uh, you can also do several other things, like store some of the information on the local level and uh, only selected important uh, information on the global level. There's some filtering language built into Collect D to do this. Um, RD tool, uh, as I mentioned, uh, it's, a, it's a command line client or library that stores data uh, locally. There's a daemon, a separate daemon available that, that does some caching, and colleague D can either do the caching itself and then write it to local disk, or it can talk to remote RD cached uh, via the uh, via protocol. Graphite is, is uh, having uh, a lot of good press these days. Uh, it's similar to our tool. It's written in Python, I think, uh, and has a nice web interface and that allows you to easily drill down into the data that you collected uh, whenever a, a problem crops up. Uh, Collect D has had a write graphite plugin for, for a while that uh, does some, some inter intelligent buffering and can uh, send huge amounts of, of uh, metrics to, to graphite uh, fast. OpenTSDB is uh, not that new, I think. Uh, it's based on Hadoop or HBase. Um, so you get horizontally scalable time series databases at the cost of getting all the Java stack on your machines. So if you're already using Hadoop or HBase, uh, that might be a very interesting option. Uh, if not, I've not actually tried this out myself. Uh, it might be easier than I thought. Uh, there's a write TCB plugin in, in Collect D that can send data there. And uh, one of the earlier slides said that Boson uses the open TCB protocol, so I haven't tried, but I think that Collect D should be able to send data there with this plugin. InfluxDB uh, only came to my attention fairly recently. Uh, it is based on LevelDB, which I think is a key value store uh, library thing, so I don't think it can do, uh, it, it stores data locally again and uh, exposes a network interface. Uh, and the interesting bit is that it uh, natively can understand the ColecD well, wire protocol, the binary protocol. It can also uh, understand the, the graphite uh, wire protocol, so you actually have a, a choice which, which protocol to use here. It, it provides a SQL-like query language, and for the last two years, uh, they claim that their clustering support is experimental, and I've no, not yet verified how experimental it is. 
And last but not least, uh, there's something called Voltaire that I just learned about the other day, um, which unfortunately does not have CollegeD support yet. But there's a talk tomorrow. So go there, uh, get fixed on Voltaire, and write a CollegeD plugin. I'll be awaiting your pull request anytime. So with this, do you have any questions? So when an agent uh, is collecting this information, is so when an agent is collecting the information, um, how do I word this? Which way does it go? So does the, the the framework tell the agent, okay, I need a piece of this information, or does the um, uh, the plugin thing send the information back into the framework? Uh, it depends. Uh, the vast majority of, of plugins uh, is is triggered at, at regular intervals by by the core kernel of, of the daemon, and then goes on and does stuff and submits its value back to the, the daemon, and the daemon then forwards it to other plugins and so on. Um, but you can also do this asynchronously. The uh, network plugin, for example, listens on the on the port, and whenever a metric comes in, it will call the same internal dispatch function uh, without being prompted to do anything. So, so as a follow-up, then... <laughs> So as a follow-up, um, what's the uh, the granularity of the timing for the, how, how accurate is the time? The the default setting is 10 seconds, 10 second intervals. Um, we at some point made a change. I don't know which version that was exactly uh, to overcome the one second finest granularity. So right now the finest granularity is two to the power of negative 30. So. I, you can you can go pretty low and you can pull really fast at the uh, expense of, of massive amounts of CPU at some point, of course. But if you want to do 10 millisecond intervals, that's possible. Uh, so you mentioned that uh, you cannot do aggregations like P99 right now. Are there any efforts to uh, fix that? Sorry, I, I can't write. So you mentioned that uh, you cannot do aggregations like I know P99 or percentiles, uh, medians. Are there any efforts to fix that? <laughs> um, there's absolutely no technical reason not to have this. Uh, it's it's a purely time-based reason. Uh, I don't unfortunately don't have the spare time right now to do much, and therefore this is on the wish list. But nobody has implemented this yet. But as a, a general rule, we try to implement stuff that people actually want. So before we set off and, and implement all the aggregation functions that you find in some statistical book somewhere, uh, we wait for people to request them before implementing such stuff. Um, because we, the idea is to, to keep it as simple as possible while providing as much functionality as, as people reasonably use. Um, but in the case of, of percentiles and median and so on, that was actually requested and that is actually something we would really like to have. It's just nobody using, uh, working on this right now. There's a question. Excuse me. Yeah, so I was just, I've been, <coughs> I've been playing with it for a bit, but um, I was wondering what your thoughts are around um, where the alerting should be going to actually trigger alarms and that sort of stuff. So there's some very simple uh, thresholding code and uh, events uh, built into Colleague D that can do the most simple things. Um, so if it's really just, if this value goes above here, then send me an email, that's possible with what Colleague D brings with itself. Um, for more uh, serious alerting, uh, there is a, a bridge to, to get the values or to get at the values that Colleague D has collected uh, from Nagios. So you can use not just to, to do your alerting, uh, which seems to be what people who have not just set up anyway tend to do. 
uh, Riemann can do these sorts of, of checks very well and integrates, for example, with PagerDuty. So you can get away with just call D Riemann and then send it off to PagerDuty to, to get some alerts. Um, and I believe those are the most common options. I'm not aware of, of a big elephant in the room otherwise. Um, when I was using ClickDeer a year or two ago, I hope it's not out, I noticed there's about four or five common dashboards that for the RRD end, and they all are sort of 80% solutions. Um, are you pushing to get a... Are you A, leaving it as is, B, trying to get a common one, or C, saying just use something from Graphite? How do you, how do you see that evolving? Um, so, CollegeD does not do graphs. That, so, so my answer would probably have to be, uh, don't care. Um, that said, <laughs> I, I don't want to ha want to bundle any one of these dashboards with CollegeD and say that's our dashboard now. Uh, I kind of like that there is an ecosystem. I would just like the ecosystem to be more on the 95% done uh, scale than on the 80% done scale. Um, that said, I recently ran into, a f what's it called, a Factorio? Fac Factorio? Uh, I can look it up and, and tweet it or something. Um, that, that seems to be really nice and really well thought out. Um, and then, of course, there is, in theory, the option to give money to, let's say, Librato or Stackdriver and uh, use whatever dashboarding they have, which is supported and well done and hosted and everything. Um, so I guess longer term, I, I probably would vote for, for keeping it as it is, as in we, we're not having the colleague dashboard, uh, but people are welcome to contribute to whatever open source uh, dashboard they like best and make it even better. But I, I look up the, the one I have in mind and, and it's, it's looking really promising. I, it looks awesome. I understand this is probably not the uh, normal use case for Collect D, but is there anything in the architecture that would prevent me from running, say, two instances on a on one specific node? No, not at all. Um, not not binding ports or anything like that. So actually, um, some of the plugins require privileges, and there is currently no very good story about dropping privileges and only keeping them for specific plugins or so. Yeah. So what people sometimes do is that they run one instance of CollegeD with root privileges, for instance, for uh, pinging and doing the network requests, um, and then a second instance <laughs> for doing all the other checks where there's no, no privileges required. Um, so no, there's, there's no single lock that you have to hold or something. Uh, that's totally possible. And people do it, so it's, it's not as uncommon as you might think. We have time for one more question. I just wonder if you can go into the roadmap a little bit and if you've got things like um, auto discovery of which module should be loaded um, or caching um, if the network's down, that sort of thing in Collect D planned. Oh boy, planned. Um, yes, so ever since my son was born early of last year, I felt hardly had any spare time to spend on this. Uh, and I'm, I'm really sorry, and I am literally thousands of emails back on the mailing list, and uh, there are, I don't know, like 200 pull requests awaiting in, in the GitHub repository, and I'm totally swamped for the little time that I can spare. Um, so I'm, I'm very sorry for this, and everybody who's blocked or waiting on me, I'm 
really sorry. Uh, I try to recruit more guys onto the team, and uh, Pierre Yves and Fabien and whoever I forgot uh, have been a, a huge help and have been doing a lot of pull requests recently, and they've been awesome. Um, but as, as far as the roadmap goes, there's currently not a, a really distinct roadmap uh, of, of things that we do. We do whatever patch is easiest to pull in gets pulled in first. So if you write a patch that is really well written and well documented and has all the uh, build system uh, changes that it requires with it and essentially all that is required to do is someone from the uh, committers list, uh, take a look at it and say, oh, this is awesome, uh, then it's probably going to be merged within a day or two and you'll be hearing from me because I'm giving out free t-shirts to people who contribute to, to, to Collect D. Um, but if it's a, a huge patch that does something really interesting, but there is a lot of work required on our side to, to verify that it's uh, reasonable and, and, I don't know, has weird coding style things and trading white spaces everywhere and is not having a man page entry, it's probably going to take a long while. So uh, there are a couple of things I, I would like to do, for instance, uh, the crypto I briefly pointed at in the networking uh, code is uh, is vulnerable to a known plain text attack and I would like to fix that uh, and probably play with OpenSSL a bit and so that kind of itches me and that is probably going to be fixed uh, in the not too distant future. Uh, I have uh, another plugin that um, allows you to uh, communicate between instances via TCP and SSL authenticated rather than UDP and essentially hand-rolled encryption. And uh, that's another thing I really wanted to go uh, to do and that has been on my desk for years. Uh, so those are the things I would focus on, but my main focus really is on looking at pull requests and whatever is as easy as to, to pull, I just pull right now. Does that answer your question halfway? Right. So uh, thank you very much for attending my talk. Uh, I'll be around for the rest of the day. I'll be wearing Coig D t-shirts, and otherwise you have seen me now. Uh -huh. um, so uh, talk me up. I, I love to chat about your use case and your feature request and uh, awesome metrics you want to have. And uh, yeah, thanks.